Let's bring in our guest for this hour, trial attorney Trey Gober. Trey, that is compelling for the state who's going to argue that on the day of the incident, the shooting, that these parents did not lock away the gun. Now, that moment obviously wasn't the day of the shooting, but it could be an example for this jury of what was common. Exactly. The biggest question for the jury will be, why should we hold accountable a parent for this really tragic uh, event, the, the murders of these uh, fellow students by, by the, their son? And the defend the I'm sorry, the prosecution is doing an amazing job of lining that out with these witnesses that, you know, in, in fact, you, you you start to feel feel sorry for the shooter himself because you can see that he's asking his parents for help and his parents refuse to, to offer that help and then they give access to the gun to the to their son. Uh, and so you can absolutely see the prosecution coming together here. The prosecutors doing it. An excellent job of presenting this case to the jury. Yeah, the text messages say a lot. The defense argued in James Crumbly's wife's case that he didn't know or they couldn't prove, saying that the state couldn't prove that that's actually what the shooter meant when he said, I was reaching out for help. And it doesn't prove that the parents knew he wanted help, but it's certainly probative and compelling evidence there inside of the courtroom. Uh, we do have to squeeze in a break, Trey, so stand by. We will have more from that witness on the stand and those messages that reveal what was going on inside of the Crumbly household. Next. All right, we are reaching the top of the hour. Let's bring in trial attorney Trey Gover, who's been watching this trial play out. We're seeing those Instagram photos, Trey, of the school shooter before he was a school shooter posting these photos. How does that go into the case against parents for what he's posting? I think generally the jury has an expectation that reasonable, responsible parents are, you know, staying in touch with their, their children, paying attention to what they're posting, paying attention to who they're hanging out with, what they're doing, what they're saying with other people. And so the fact that this information can be found by these investigators just goes further to show that it, it's not believable that the defendant, in this case, the shooter's dad, just didn't know or couldn't have known. There were so many warning signs. There was, it was so obvious for any objective person that's paying attention. And that's ultimately the standard that's going to have to be proved by the state that is an objective parent, given the same circumstances, would have acted differently. And I think the state's doing a very good job of laying that out for, for the prosecution. Uh, Trey, how do you feel about this being the father versus the mother? We've got two separate trials. Mother went first. She was already convicted. In your mind, is this just a, a, a drawn-out way to get to another conviction because it's the same evidence, essentially? Or are there some caveats in your mind, some differences between how a jury may view the mother and her responsibility and the father? I, I think the case against the father is stronger than the case against the mother. Every defendant has their right to a day in court, uh, so we can't fault the defendant for, you know, wanting to take this to trial. Every jury is different. Every case is different. Uh, so it's not a foregone conclusion that we'll get a conviction, but I think the case against the father is stronger. All right. Well, I appreciate your insight on that, Trey Young. Thank you so much uh, for being with us this hour and for lending your expertise. Coming up, Matt Johnson is picking up our coverage. Matt, I will hand it over to you.